scripture, Psalm 145, verses 1 to 9, is what we're looking at. Inspired by hearing the spatial music practice last Sunday, How Great Thou Art, the message title is Our Great God. He is a great God, and He is alone worthy of our praise. He is all sufficient, He is altogether lovely, He has provided everything we need here and for eternity. What a great God. Amen. There are a lot of little gods in the world. Anything that takes the place of or tries to imitate the power of him is a little god. And little gods have no, should have no significance or should have no place in our life according to the scriptures. David authored this psalm, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of that might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness, and they shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Father, we thank you that you are a good father, and everything you do is good because that's your essence. And you are love, and you are all that we need, and thank you for that. You are worthy of our praise. Help us to be people of praise every day of our lives. Thank you for the praise that will be offered through the instruments that will take stage in a moment. Help us in what we do and say this week to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our great God, and as you saw in the background, he loved us so much that he sent us that perfect gift that indescribable gift his name is Jesus Jesus is that name above all names and names mean something in the scripture and that name meant savior and he is the savior of the world to all those that place their faith and trust in him what a great God we have and as David is the psalmist and declaring the goodness of God and there is admonition given to us to recognize who he is, what he is doing, and to give him praise. And we have a challenge given to us, as David says, every day I will bless you. Every day of our life we ought to give praise to God. One, that we have another day that he has allotted to us. And that he is our God and he'll never leave us or forsake us. And that he has everything we need for the situations we're in. He has provided the essentials for life and the, the, set, the things we need for eternity with the heavens that he has prepared. But David in this psalm and on the heels of this psalm, why they're broken into the ways that they are, because they were songs often sung by the Israelites as they would go to sacrifice and to offer their worship to him. The last part of verse 15 of chapter 144 says, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. I want to tell you, we live in a culture where people have a lot of small gods in their life. It could be an activity, it could be a thing, it could be a relationship, it could be anything that comes in front of God's plan for you and your relationship with Him is an idol and we ought to be considered to cast that aside and to get your priorities right and make sure that he is on the throne of your heart and that he is the one who guides and directs you and you listen to his lead. But as I jot and thought of this message, I thought of three things coming from this passage. Verses 1 to 3 indicates that God's worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise, his worth. And then we see his works in verses 4 to 7, how he is doing things that you can't even imagine. They're unsearchable. And then you see his ways in verses 8 and 9. And as we continue throughout the chapter, there's more admonitions and more instructions given. 
But we'll just touch on these three things, the worth that he has. He is, first of all, David acknowledges his position. My God, O King. Do you see the personal relationship there? He is a personal God. He needs to be that in your life. And he desires you to go to him as a father. David didn't really have that privilege to go to the father. He, didn't have, he had to go to the high priest. And the high priest had to do those sacrifices and go into the most holy place. We as believers, having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, have access to the throne of the Father because of the work of redemption. And that ought to give us a challenge and a motivation to be a person that enhances that relationship and desires it. As David says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. If you notice, as you come to travel to church or on your journeys... If you look at the water bodies around us, they're almost dry. And there was the one road I was on, the deer had gone over the hill to get a drink and the creek was dry. And the deer come out. If you could say that it had a look of disappointment, it did. But it was looking for something to drink. And let me tell you that when you drink from the water well of Jesus, you will be satisfied for eternity. As the woman he dealt with in John chapter 4, drink from the well, that, the water of life that I give you, and you'll never thirst again. When you find Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's enough to satisfy your soul. And you know what's more than enough is when we give him more of us. If you don't have any room for Jesus, you're too full yourself, and you need to give, give him the space. So look at God's worth, his position, who he is. He deserves our respect. Don't take his name in vain. Be careful about the name of God. And the scriptures tells us in the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Not only in our speech, but in the way that we live our lives. You ought to reflect the fact that you're a Christian. But it says when we take his name in vain, he will not hold us guiltless. Be careful about your reverence and respect to God. And the scribes were writing the scriptures and they would come to the name of God. They would go and take a bath and put on clean clothing before they would write his name. They had that much respect every time they came to it. And we need to have respect for him. And when people use that, his name loosely and they curse with it, I admonish you not to be that kind. And you might need to speak up and say, you know what? He is a loving God. And that's how I answered some of the guys that would do that in the arena where I had to work during college. They would take the name of Jesus in vain. And when they would, I would say, they would say his name. And I'd say, yep, Savior of the world. Yep, he's my friend. And you know, that's just the way it is. Respect for the name of God. His, acknowledging his position. And you know, in our, in our life, there is not a lot of respect, but we ought to have it for at least our God. His name, I noticed in verses 1 to 3, he says, I will bless you, and I will bless your name forever and ever in verse 1. So his name tells a lot of things. In the name of God, there's several, Elohim, you know, and there's other ones in the Yahweh, and throughout the names for Jesus, and names about the Holy Spirit. But those are great names, and you ought to always capitalize. I, I can't even write, when I'm writing sermons and come to writing Christ or God or Jesus, I can't use lowercase. It's just, if I do, I get convicted and have to go back. But I'm glad about that, because he is worthy of the capital letter. And you know, it should almost be all capitals. He is worthy of our respect. His name, your name says a lot. At least it did in biblical days, sometimes not so much anymore. Sometimes people use names for significance, but they meant a lot in the Bible time. Last thing under his worth is his unsearchable greatness that it talks about. You're never going to be able to exhaust the knowledge of God. His ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55, 12, I think it is, or 11. It's in Isaiah 55, but his ways supersede our ways. They're just touching on the iceberg in the galaxy. They have no idea. They guess how many stars there are. They say there are this many million or billion. I don't even know how many they say now. But they guess at how many there are. Do you know what? God knows every one of their names. 
All the stars he has named, the Bible says, either that's true or God lied. And I can tell you, God didn't lie. He knows everything. He knows everything about you. Psalm 139 tells that. He knew your thoughts. And he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Talk about a good God. Amen. And one that knows what life's all about. He is awesome in all that he is. So you see his unsearchable greatness. What he is doing and what he is going to do. I hadn't thought of these things. That he's sustaining the world. No one else could do it. Do you see the moon this morning? It's just a little bitty, look like, like almost a fingernail piece at the very bottom. And do you notice the things that he does? It's spectacular. He does nothing by random, everything by detail, down to your life. Do you know that he detailed your personality? And he detailed your affections and the things that you don't like? He knows all that stuff about you. He is an architect, a master designer. So we can notice that he sustains the world. He keeps the oceans in their boundaries. He keeps the galaxies from collapsing. He keeps the right oxygen level and the temperature and all those kinds of things. And don't get involved in that because you'll mess it up. I don't go for the global warming thing. I don't go for the change climate. I go for the master of the wind. I go for the sustainer of the universe. And there will be a global warming I'm telling you, read Revelation, there's going to be that. But it'll be under his guidelines. So we have a God who is involved in every area of life. The unsearchable greatness of what he's done. Sustaining the world, suppressing the evil. Aren't you glad that he does that? Amen. He can protect you in the midst of terrible situations. And he can calm the storm you're in, or he can calm the person that's causing the storm. He can take care of that. The sanctifying of the saved, he's still doing that. So he's got a lot of things he's doing, his unsearchable greatness. And he's got a lot of work ahead of him, so let's just be patient and allow him to work in our lives. So look at his work. Some of the works of verses 4 to 7 indicate one thing, that it's perpetual. Generation to generation. Class, every one of us have probably heard our grandparents or great-grandparents talking about the faithfulness of God. That's nothing new. Do you think that Abraham would have talked about it? I can assure you he would. And I can assure you that you go on in through the prophets. They're going to talk about it. You get to the day, you get to the disciples. They're all going to talk about how great God was. Where do you see the woman that was at the well in heaven? She's just going to say, man, I can't believe it, that he chose me to be the first this person to accept him after his resurrection. You know, just all that kind of stuff. And the little boy that gave his lunch. And all, I mean, you, thousands of years ago, the faithfulness of God. You know what? It's going to be, remain faithful till he comes again. And he's going to be faithful throughout eternity. So you have the perpetualness of God's works. They're going to go on forever. What the God does goes, is everlasting. It goes on forever. Philippians 1, 6. He that began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And you know, the scripture says that the word of God is settled forever in Psalms. So you have the promises there of the perpetual work of God. Then it's spectacular. Verse 5. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. Talk about writing. That's some big words that saying, wow, you think you saw a grand finale? You think you seen something? The splendor. I can't even imagine, as the song says, what heaven will look like. And what it'll be when we get there. The glorious splendor of his majesty. I hope that you see it some here. And can't wait to see how it is in perfect form. Well, I see the splendor of his majesty often in simple things like wildflowers. And simple things like sunsets and sunrises. And now that he can, beyond the creation, how that he can transform lives. From someone who has a life wrecked with vices... And difficulties and he transforms it into their servants of God in declaring his goodness from haters of God to lovers of God only God can do that and he's still doing that so don't give up and keep praying for those that are not doing what is right because God can still change hearts and he can still change lives so his works are spectacular and last thing verses 6 and 7 they are transforming they, men will speak of his awesome acts and declare his greatness. 
And, the, you know, they will utter your goodness. Look at the last words. And they shall sing of your righteousness. Willingness to sing his praise. And, the, you know, as I read in the Daily Bread, and I forget exactly what passage they were in this morning, but it, because of our relationship with God, our call is to be righteous and holy. Righteous is doing what is right. Holy is set apart for his service. So do what's right for where he has placed you and what he wants you to do. Wherever you are, he has a plan. And he wants you to be a person of praise and recognize him at work and for who he is. As we see his ways in verses 8 and 9, talk about a fivefold blessing. You see, the generosity, it says, the Lord is gracious. Aren't you glad that he is? Amen. He is kind. He is gracious to us. He is secondfold there. He is what? Full of compassion. Amen. Compassion is they see you need a tender touch and they do it. Compassion is seeing someone in distress and taking action. You know, the person that go on the road with the flat tire and a family of six and it's the same way. They're in distress and they need some help. Oh, I'll pray for you, sister. See, no, no, you stop and you do what you can do. That's compassion, full of compassion. He is not only gracious, but he's full of compassion. Slow to anger. Aren't you glad about that? Yeah. When we disobey that he doesn't, right, okay, that's it. Whack a mole, you're done. You know, he is gracious and he is compassionate and he is long-suffering. He is great in mercy, holding back what we deserve. He understands that we are dust, says Psalm 139. He knows we're going to fail and he knows we're going to make mistakes. Did he know that about Peter, the apostle? <coughs> he said, when, hey, Peter, the devil has desired to sift you like wheat, but when you are restored... And when you, I have prayed for you and he came back, he was powerful and restored back to service. Aren't you glad he understands those things? So you have his mercy. The last, I have these two verses underlined, highlighted, asterisk and all that other stuff. The Lord is good to who? All. That's you. That's me. Don't blame God. He's good. God is all good and he's good to all. You can count on it. You know, he's too wise to make mistakes. He's too loving to be unkind. And he has your best interest in mind. You say, well, I don't necessarily like what his interests are. Well, you know what? He's made, conforming you to the image of Christ. I talked to someone this week, and they were talking about God's timing. We don't always appreciate it. But he knows what we need when we need it. And his timing is 100% accurate. He doesn't strike out. He hits it every time home run. Batting a thousand. So you have his mercy and his goodness to all. His tender mercies are what? Over all his works. We have a great God. Worthy of our praise. And because of his great love, he was willing to sacrifice his best. And as I concluded, God gave everything because of his love for us. What are we willing to give to him? Oh, God, you can have a little bit of my time, or you can have a little bit of the things you've entrusted to me, or you can have some of my talents, but I want to use it. No, he, he wants a total surrender because he has total blessings and things you can't even imagine prepared for you if you love him and serve him. So says Corinthians. So he has given us an allotted time. He has given us talents. He has given us treasures. And he's worthy of us to serve him and praise him. I hope you'll do your part. You need to be as the teen motto is, all in, all the time. And if he has your heart, he'll have every part of your life. And that is a great God, and you'll never be sorry that you served him. I believe it was Ross that told me, whether it was him or his dad, that said he never met a person that said that they're sorry they served the Lord that long. It's always, I wish I would have had more time to serve him. Because serving him, he's the best master there is. But to be a bond servant to him, he owns it all. He cares for you more than the world. He cares for you and he loves you. Why not serve him and give him your heart? Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the admonitions that David penned under the lead of you. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is within the, us as believers. If there be anyone that don't know you as Lord and Savior, may they recognize their need for forgiveness and ask you to forgive them of their sin and to be, come into their life and be their Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for the promises of your word, for how that it inspires us and encourages us. And that we can praise you through worship, we can praise you through instrument, we can praise you through song, and praise you through sacrifice. We just thank you, God, that you are long-suffering and merciful and generous and patient and constantly at work in our lives. Help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen.